We have an incredible story in front of us this morning. I hope that you'll join with me as we continue just to honor God through our lives and our worship this morning. My name is Chris Conway. I'm the middle school pastor here. And I've just absolutely loved the time I've had to spend with the junior high students. Uh, and high school students, high school students as well. There's just so much potential, so much desire to learn about what the world is and what our place can be in it. And so as, as a high school student, I remember trying to find as many different things as possible that I could try, new experiences. One of the things that I did for all four years during high school was theater. Not as an actor, goodness no, that was, that was outside my experience. I was a sound tech. I put together a lot of the sound effects for different kind of plays and musicals and would try to run the wireless mics. Being a sound tech has all of its own challenges. I mean, if something goes wrong, that's the only time people pay attention to you. So thank you for you guys up there. You are fantastic. That's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, but, but my senior year, I don't know why this idea came across my head, but it did. And so I, I had to go with it. I felt like I wanted to know what it was like to be on the other side of the stage. And so I had no desire to actually be in a play, but I did, just for the experience, decide to try out for a play. And so I joined with all the other theater goers who wanted to actually be in it, and were kind of standing outside the theater waiting to be led in for the audition. And finally, my time comes. And they hand me this script. I should have known this was going to happen. There was only one role in this play for a tall, skinny white guy. And that was the lead role. And so in my hand now, I have the script for the lead role for this play I don't actually want to be in. So I walk into the theater, I sit down, and I'm I'm reading through the script. I'm trying to get into this character's head. What is going on? What is he thinking? What are the emotions? And as I just continue to delve more and more into the script, I realize I don't want any part of this right now. There's nothing here that I want to be a part of. The the idea of actually being in a play was completely overwhelming. I mean, what if by some weird chance I actually got the part? I couldn't do this. This was completely outside my experience. And the terror and the fear of the situation began to overwhelm me. I couldn't quite bring myself just to up and leave the auditorium. So finally, the theater director calls me up there on stage and I walk up kind of sheepishly with this paper in my hand, just shaking like a baseball card in a bicycle wheel. You know, it's just this horrible noise. And of course, I can't see now what's on the paper. So as she's reading her lines, I'm trying to respond. I'm deleting words. I'm making up words. None of it makes sense anymore. The whole situation, I just wanted to get out of it. It was a story I wanted no part in. Too much was going to be asked of me for me to really engage in this story. Well, this morning, we have a story that demands that we understand what we're getting ourselves into. That it demands that we understand that being a part of this story changes everything about who we are. Kent has already invited you to turn to Mark chapter 16. If you haven't done that, I invite you to go ahead. There are some Bibles in front of you. And verses 1 through 8 are what we're looking at this morning. If you've been with us since October, we've been going through a series called This Changes everything. We started in the very first chapter, very first verse of Mark, and today we're going to finish Mark through verse 8. And from the beginning, Mark has been challenging us with this question, who is Jesus? Right off the bat at verse 1, he tells us this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And throughout the story, you see different characters who are trying to wrestle with the same question, who is Jesus? What does his presence on this earth mean? What can I make of these miracles and these teachings that I'm seeing? In chapter 8, Peter, one of his most beloved disciples, figures out that this man is the Messiah. And he declares it to Jesus. And at that time, Jesus says, well, don't tell anyone yet, but Peter knows. And going forward, Jesus continues to be in conflict with the leaders of the day. See, he's giving people this new message of hope, that things aren't the way they seem, that the way life has been isn't the only way life can be, and people are beginning to believe him. And as he's teaching these things, he's also performing miracles, and he's speaking with an authority that the leaders of the day could not tolerate. Because if what Jesus was saying was true, it would mean the complete disestablishment of everything that they were and stood for. And so eventually, the teachings of Jesus come to a head, and their leaders have to arrest him and lead him to his death. And in this process, his disciples desert him. Even Peter, who was so certain he would never 
never deny his Lord, three times denies him the night of Jesus' arrest. And as his disciples scatter and Jesus kind of left alone in this process, he is convicted by his own words when he says, yes, I am the Son of God. Jesus is convicted and led to a cross, his hands and feet nailed to it. It's there that he gave his life. And for us as Christians, we see the cross as this incredible sign of sacrifice and courage. It's actually become kind of the symbol that we carry with us. Some around our necks, sometimes you see it on your Bible. This cross represents everything that Jesus did for us. And it is truly remarkable, the sacrifice that he was willing to make. But something seems amiss. Some part of this story doesn't quite make sense. Somewhere, Mark must have got something wrong. See, as your fifth grade English teacher told you, all good stories tend to follow a very similar pattern. You begin with the introduction of the character, the protagonist, the person who this story is actually about. And as you learn more and more about this character, you begin to understand what makes him or her unique and how that person is different than the rest of the world around them. And inevitably, whatever is going through the mind and the heart of that character will lead to some sort of conflict. And that conflict will continue to escalate. And through that conflict, that character will come into opposition with other forces, other people, other things. And so far, so good. It seems like Mark is telling a fantastic story because this is exactly what Jesus had been doing. He was in conflict, a good conflict, where he was telling people that what they knew wasn't the whole story. And so we expect that in this process, everything would continue to rise until it reached a peak, a climax, where everything would come together. And we begin to understand the full impact of the story. And to us, it seems like the cross in that moment, that should be it. This is the moment where Jesus will triumph. But the story doesn't feel right. Because after Jesus dies, everything comes to a grinding halt. There is no actual resolution, this fourth piece. Everything goes back to the way it was. Life hadn't changed a bit. The story didn't have a point. And that's what the disciples felt the Saturday after the crucifixion. Saturday, it's, it's the Sabbath day. It's the day of rest for that culture And the leaders, they were actually resting really well after a job well done, having pulled together an incredibly unlikely trial, getting a crucifixion sentence the day after. The leaders felt like they had something to rejoice about. They rested in that. But for the followers of Jesus, that was no day of resting. That was a day of uncertainty. A day of confusion. A day where it just seemed like everything that they had been working for for the last three years, didn't matter. The disciples, we don't know exactly what they were doing, but there's, there's clues from the text that there's probably a good chance that they were already packing up. They were already preparing to go back to Galilee, their home, hometown, already preparing to go back to their old lives, to be fishermen, whatever it was that they were doing before they met Jesus. That's what they knew, and that's all that was left. And even as the disciples are preparing to go, the the woman, there's a couple of women who are there at the cross with Jesus. They stay behind. They don't know, they don't have any more hope than the disciples do, but they have a devotion to their Lord. And because it's a Sabbath, they can't go see Jesus just yet, but they are going to wait until Sunday to see the body of the one that they love so much for three years, to anoint him with spices and to say, yes, this this is someone who's worthy of respect. But all of them, I just felt like the world had just seeped back into its brokenness. Uh, if I'm a bad actor, I'm a far worse athlete. A few weeks ago, a couple friends of mine, uh, we all went bowling together. And there are too many of us to do just one lane. So we kind of split. And we didn't really even mean to do this, but we split roughly along skill level lines. And so to my left, we had people who were getting spares and strikes, you know, pretty much every time. And scoring above 150 awesome. In my lane, we're just happy if we hit pins. That's pretty much all I wanted. See, the problem I have is that when I bowl, I I try to get the ball to go straight, but inevitably my hand curves before I release the bowling ball. And so the bowling ball follows the trajectory of my arm and just goes off into the gutter pretty much every time. 
And so the first four or five frames, I'm really trying to correct this. You know, I know the really good bowlers, they like do this crazy spin move right along the gutter. I don't even want that. I just want it to go straight. If I can get the ball to go straight, I'm doing fine. But by the fifth frame, no change has been made whatsoever in my throw. It is still going off to the side. And so right around then, I realize I need to develop a new strategy. And so I, I take my bowling ball, I look at the pins, and I do this. And for the rest of the game, I hit a lot more pins, all right? I come to accept that the slant in my throw is inevitable. There's nothing I can do about it, and so I need to adjust my bowling to play to the slant that I just can't seem to correct. A lot of times in life, there are things that we just take for granted as being the slants in this world. The things that we have no control over. There are brokenness. In the world around us, we see poverty and violence and hatred. People who are suffering from disease and disasters and sickness, death. And there's nothing we can do about it. So we just accept that that's the way things are. That's the way things have always been and that's the way that things always will be. And we live our lives adjusting to that. Trying to put it out of our mind trying to ignore it because there's nothing we can do. In many ways, even worse than all the brokenness we see around us is the brokenness we see in ourselves. We aren't the people that we want to be. Our relationships are what we want them to be. We aren't the sons and daughters and friends that we want to be. In some cases, we aren't the parents or the spouses we want to be. Things are so incomplete and broken. We find that we go through life just assuming That there's a slant. That our own failures and our own brokenness is too much. We're never going to be able to fully live life as it was intended. And so we adjust. We step sideways and we say, what is it that I can find that can give me a sense of security? We find all sorts of ways to give ourselves a false sense of security. Or just sometimes it's just entertainment. Find a way to be distracted from the brokenness that is our lives in the lives of the people around us. And this moment, that's what the disciples, that's what the woman, anyone who were following Jesus was saying to themselves, I thought this guy had a different vision. I thought he was going to get rid of the slant. I thought he was going to show us that there is more to this world than what we see, but now he is dead. And with him dies his hope. I just have to get used to the slant. Well, the woman, they, they're still there. They're preparing to go to Jesus' tomb. That's actually really interesting. If you're a first century gospel writer, if there's anything you can do about it, you're not going to put women into the story as the main characters because women just weren't seen as reliable, which is ironically kind of how we know that this is rather authentic because this isn't something they would have chosen to do unless the women were there. And so we, here we have these three women, not reliable sources, also not powerful There wasn't anything they could do about the culture they were in. The fact that it was a Sabbath day on Saturday. They couldn't go buy the spices that they needed. They couldn't go visit Jesus. They also had a a physical power problem. They they knew that once they got to the tomb, there was going to be another issue. And you see this in verse 3. They're saying, who's going to roll the stone away for us? The three of them together could not put enough force to move that heavy stone. It was going to be too much. There's so little power there. But these women, who no one would have seen as reliable, who no one felt like they had any power, also weren't afraid. At least they weren't afraid enough to be held away from Jesus. See, they stood there at the cross while he was dying, basically in the face of the authorities of the men of death itself, saying, we believe in this guy, even when everything else seems to be crumbling And that same love and that same devotion toward Jesus compels them to go to the tomb even though they're not even sure how they're going to get inside of it. Because that fear is not going to hold them back. They're going to find a way to connect with Jesus. But if they weren't reliable, if they didn't have power, if they weren't afraid, they also weren't very expectant. See, like you and me, And a lot of people, 
the idea of someone escaping the tomb on their own is categorically impossible. They didn't expect anything other than to go to a sealed tomb and then if they could find a way in to find Jesus there where they left him. But it's kind of tragic, really, because God has been doing something in human history since the beginning. And some of his prophets even picked up on that. He used this prophet Isaiah to talk to an Israelite community in exile to say there's something else going on here. And so in chapter 43, verse 18, he says this, Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams and the wasteland. What these women couldn't have known is that their past wasn't the end of the story. What they saw wasn't the end of the story. God was forging a new way forward in the midst of what was one of the most depressing moments of their lives. The past did not hold sway because God was going to do something incredible. This takes us to verse 4. The women arrive at the tomb and they could not possibly have expected what they were going to see then. The tomb had already been rolled open. This barrier that they thought was almost certainly going to keep them from Jesus had already been removed. God was already providing them a way into the tomb. But they couldn't expect the next part either. They couldn't expect what they would see in the tomb. The entrance was probably too short for someone to simply walk into, so you kind of have to duck a little bit. And when they they emerge in the tomb, they see two things they weren't expecting. One, they don't see Jesus. He's supposed to be there. And the other is a man in white, a messenger whose identity they don't know. See, the women, they knew the people who followed Jesus. They knew those who might have wanted to be at the tomb. They even knew that most of them had probably already fled town. They couldn't imagine anybody else who would want to be there in that tomb with someone who was executed as a common criminal. There was no reason for this man to be there. But as much as they couldn't expect the tomb to be open, as much as they couldn't expect the man to be sitting there, they could never have been prepared for what they were about to hear. In seeing the woman, the man tells them, you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. Who was crucified. And the women so far are kind of nodding in agreement. Yes, that's, that's why we're here. He says, oh, he is risen. Now, you have to understand this. Those words, if there was any semblance of truth to them whatsoever, that would change everything. And the woman in the tomb, they began to understand that. See, if there is any truth to the words, he is risen, then all of history is recast. All of history is changed in light of this fact. See, from the beginning, God has been restoring his people. He called up Israel. He brought up kings and prophets, delivered Israel from exile. Then he sent his son, this Jesus who they loved and adored for so many years, who was tempted who had miracles to perform and teachings to give, who suffered at the hands of sinners and ultimately died on the cross. These things, they now make sense if it is true that he is risen. All of history is changed because everything now is pointing to the fact that this God is strong enough to overcome anything in this world. Anything. And the women, they begin to tremble Because they realize that this meant everything was different for them, too. Their broken lives, everything they saw in this world that they took as inevitable, the slant that they just could never get rid of, that they would just have to adjust to, it was no longer an obstacle that could not be overcome. Because if Jesus could beat death, and he could beat all those other cycles, Isolation, violence, hatred, our own sins and imperfections, the brokenness that we feel inside, all these things crumble before a God who is risen. And the women realize it's just not them. 
This message is for everybody. As the man begins to tell them, now go, tell the other disciples and tell Peter. By name he mentions Peter. The one who had denied Jesus must have felt like he never deserved his second chance. By name he said, this message is for him too. Go tell them. Jesus is on his way ahead of them to Galilee. Follow him. See what he's doing. The joy that is possible at this moment cannot be explained fully. Because everything now really is different. Everything really has changed. All of the brokenness in this world is overcome in a risen Jesus. If I could, it would be nice to stop the story right there. The problem is, there's this verse 8. And verse 8, we see something that looks like a total failure. And this is honestly the reason why most pastors just don't choose to give an Easter message out of Mark. It kind of ends on a rather depressing note. See, these women, as they're understanding everything that they, they're seeing and hearing, they become bewildered and terrified. And even though for the first time in the gospel, they're finally given permission to go and to speak about who Jesus is, they flee the tomb and they don't say anything to anyone. What happened? We have the best news that the world has ever heard, that Jesus is risen, that everything that we know about this world has just been turned upside down, and these women flee. (laughs) Why? You know, if you have your Bibles in front of you, and if you're using a pew Bible, what you're going to see next is a line and then a note about how verses 9 through 20 don't show up in some of the older manuscripts or other ancient witnesses. And that's just kind of what scholars have began to agree upon, that this ending that was put on to Mark in verses 9 through 20 came after the fact that some original readers of the story felt probably like we feel, that this ending of the woman fleeing terrified and not saying anything wasn't sufficient. And so knowing more of the story, they would write other things in there, and other endings to this story have surfaced. But a lot of scholars believe that actually Mark intended verse 8 to be the final verse, that this was, in fact, the ending note he wanted to give. Because, you see, terror is a very appropriate response in this scenario. Very similar to, and just to a greater degree, my experience with my theater teacher, who was just telling me that this was not a story I should be a part of. And I knew that, that this story was so terrifying to me, I could not jump into it wholly. These women knew that to put themselves in the story of the risen Jesus would demand more of them than they knew how to give in that moment. Everything around them would change, but they would have to change. They would have to be different. Everything that they understood about life would have to be altered. And at that moment, there was too much terror, too much confusion, too much bewilderment for them to do anything with it. Now, Mark knew that his readers would know more of the story. See, the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts, they tell more of the story. We know that ultimately the woman did speak. They spoke to the disciples, and the disciples told others. And through that, we had the emergence of the movement that we know as a church that we are part of today. Mark's readers knew all of that. What Mark, a lot of scholars think, was trying to communicate is that this was the moment for his readers to say yes to the story. See, it wasn't over. Everything was beginning anew. The cross wasn't the end. The resurrection isn't just an epilogue. The story is beginning again, and it begins with us. How are we going to respond to this movement that Jesus is on? How are we going to partner with him in restoring this broken world? How are we going to let him infiltrate the deepest parts of our lives, take over the brokenness in our lives and say, you are a new creation? Are we willing to step fully into this story, to be willing to fully engage? Not like the woman who were afraid at that moment, the woman who death itself didn't scare them, but an empty grave did. For us, let us jump into the story of the risen Christ. Jump into the story of the God who gave up everything for us, suffered and died, and then rose again, changing all of history. So this morning we come to this story in a number of different places. For some of you, kind of like the woman before they went into the tomb, the idea of a risen Lord is just categorically impossible. 
Or perhaps you've known Christians or have had some negative experiences of the Christians or the church or even God has made it just so that this story can be nothing more than simply a story for you. That the reality of the resurrection isn't at a place where it can infiltrate your life. And for whatever hand that Christians or the church has played in making that so difficult to hear, I'm sorry. We are a broken people. We always have been and we will be until Jesus comes. But we are people who are trying to honor God with our lives. So just know this, that this Easter, there is hope and love for you displayed at the cross and at the resurrection. For others, you've been listening to this story for a while. This isn't the first time you've heard it, but you are curious. You want to know more. Well, for the next six weeks, we're going to continue to discuss the idea of the resurrection the risen Jesus appeared to many people and changed their lives. The part of the story we don't get this morning will hear over the next six weeks. I invite you to come back, ask questions with us, wrestle with us as we try to figure out more and more of who this Jesus is and how he has changed our lives. For some of you, you've acknowledged the reality of the resurrection, you've lived by it, but you just don't feel like you're a full participant in the story. Something's holding you back. Something is preventing you from being able to be fully engaged. This is Easter. This is a time of new beginnings. This is the right moment to say, I want to be back in the story. I want to be not just an onlooker, but I want to be a participant. Knowing that this story is not something that simply shows up on the pages of books or on movie screens, but this is a story that redefines reality itself, and I want in all the way. And for some of you, this may be the first time where you realize, yes, I do believe in this Jesus. I do believe that he has shown us a different way to live, and I want to be part of it. For the first time, I want to make a commitment to follow God with my life. And if that's where you're at this morning, then I invite you to pray with me. We're going to say a prayer, and it doesn't, it's not anything magical. By saying a prayer to God, you know, the halos don't suddenly appear on people's heads. This is not usually the way it goes. Life doesn't suddenly get better. But you will have known that you are fully in God's story. And from that moment on, the life of following Jesus into Galilee and beyond is greater than anything that we could possibly hope for or imagine. So I invite you to join me with that as well. Let's pray together.